Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 195, wow, we're getting close to 200. We're almost there. We're going to talk a little bit about inrush surge, what it is and why it matters to pretty much everyone. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult the professional technician when in doubt. Today we're going to take a look at what happens when you first turn on your tube amp. Basically, the capacitors, in particular the large filter caps, need to fill. And That's that, these guys right here. <laughs> yep. And we'll look more at that in just a minute. So the large filter caps need to fill and that electrical action draws a, a short but large amount of current. Well, larger than the amp normally will idle at. And this is normally called inrush current. Yep. Now, why does that matter? Well, if you're buying an inexpensive Chinese amp or something your buddy built for you or even your you know, you like to noodle on your own uh, bench and build stuff for yourself, which would be great. Um, but in particular, if, you, if you're buying Chinese amps, which is really common, a lot of our customers um, retube those amps as soon as they arrive. They just aren't impressed with those inexpensive tubes that uh, are sold with the amps. In fact, almost every um, uh, tube amp that is sold today and for the last decade or two is sold with a very inexpensive set of tubes, even a very expensive amp. And the reason for that, of course, is the tubes are very expensive. So if they can send out an amp with cheap tubes and keep the price point down, well, you're more than likely going to buy it. And then you'll realize, unfortunately, you've got to retube it. And a good set of tubes might cost as much as the amp. Yeah, easily, sometimes more. Um, and of course, the tubes are the amplifiers. Yeah. So <laughs> the, this is just, this is essentially the chassis and the components that link up the tubes and allow them to work in circuit um, and bring power to them, of course. Um, but anyways, so what happens when you retube um, a Chinese amp or an amp in which it has not been respecting the specifications of the tubes it's spec for is that with a rectifier tube on startup, you might find that it arcs or it, go, it makes a nice little snap inside. Or you may even blow a fuse. Or you may blow a fuse or you might blow a tube. And the reason this is happening is the Chinese designers aren't working with true vintage tubes or the original specifications for those tubes. Even though they actually are using um, a specification tube, the modern copies that they build just aren't the same tube anymore. Uh, they're just, in, in many cases, they're not on spec. And they will, I think in the Chinese factories, they have a tendency to be tempted to improve the spec, let's say, if they can. Uh, though I don't see a lot of evidence of improvement with Chinese tubes. Um, but what happens is if they take a rectifier tube, and here's a really good example. Here's a original uh, Svetlana. Now it's got its Cyrillic number on here, but this is an exact 5U4G rectifier tube. It's a, it's a twin tube, so it's a full wave rectifier. This is a very common tube that is used in um, many uh, of the better quality Chinese amps that have a rectifier in the power supply. Mm. And um, this tube is on spec. It was, it was built by one of the best of the vintage tube manufacturers. It's an excellent, excellent uh, rectifier. And of course, they come in these gorgeous ST or shoulder type uh, glass envelopes. So. Yeah, it's got everything going for it. Um, great, great manufactured quality and very sexy. <laughs> the problem is, is the Chinese made a copy of this. I believe it's called the 274B and it is not the same as a 5U4, even though it's claimed that it is. Yeah, so what they, what they do, unfortunately, is they'll, they'll design around 
what they think is the 5U42, but in fact, they'll actually test the Chinese version of it. And if the Chinese version's not on spec with the vintage tube, that was, I mean, back in the day, specifications weren't just a bunch of paper that you could, you know, um, recycle whenever you felt like it. They were, they were sacrosanct. They were the Bible of the tube. So if the, um, if the spec or data sheet says the first cap, and we're going to look at the first cap in a minute. If the first cap can't be larger than 10 microfarad, that's 10 UF, um, that, that what that says is that the rectifier can't handle more inrush current than that first cap can fill. But in order to try to get um, tube gear uh, noise floor down around solid state, a lot of manufacturers in modern times have uh, been too large of a first cap and building too large uh, a filtration stage period with lots and lots of capacitance. And that's fine for solid state. And we're going to look at that in a minute as well. But for vintage uh, rectifiers, it's a huge problem. This whole business of not building tubes on spec isn't just with rectifiers. The uh, Chinese have a whole series of, of tube types that are copies of Western types and former Soviet types. And, um, and constantly we see that what they consider to be the standard, let's say a 6N1P, which is a very common Soviet type of... of uh, uh, dual triode. Yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, won't operate properly if we use the Soviet version, which doesn't make any sense. But if you plug in the uh, higher spec version, the Dash EV, it'll work just fine. So when it comes to actually replacing um, Chinese tubes, and it doesn't matter what, what it is, whether it's a rectifier or a twin or power tube, you've got to be really careful because um, the manufacturers in China are creating all kinds of problems by not testing their... Uh, their builds at the prototyping stage, and this actually is a prototype we're going to look at in just a minute. Um, we're not testing them with the true vintage spec tubes, and hopefully some of them are actually paying attention and watching these videos. <laughs> not likely, um, but anyways. Uh, so let's just break for a second, and we'll come back and we'll take a look at this. Okay, so this is a prototype of what is probably going to become a new kit amp. This is an OTL headphone amp. <laughs> and how many versions into it are we now? Uh, well, yeah, we started off with uh, fairly quickly getting a good working circuit that sounded amazing. And then we rebuilt it about six times. So Has it only been six? It feels like it's been twice that. Well, six major times. A whole bunch of little ones. So it uses the 6080 or the 6AS7 tube. So these are big honking tubes, and they can pass current, which of course is why it's in an OTL amp. Now this show is not about the headphone amp kit or the 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 prototype build. We're going to do a complete episode on this, and probably one for the kit amp channel as well, because it's interesting, I think, uh, and it's going to be a great. Well, it is a great sounding headphone amp that. We're going to try to make as affordable as possible. So, of course, there's no cover over here. So just ignore that. What you want to look at, though, is look at all the large capacitors. Now, these are 390 microfarad, 450 volt caps. They're Nishikon caps. These are, these are basically industry standard for a large electrolytic cap. And they will snap a lot of current when it turns on. And we're going to actually do that for you in a minute. But... Let's flip it over. And another caution, if you have a lot of big caps like this, this is what will get you inside of an amplifier. High voltage, high capacity caps. So be very careful, make sure they're discharged before doing something like this with your own. Yeah, let's flip it over. And yeah, so that's a very good caution. And, and what happens, you may have noticed that the IEC is not plugged in. What happens is, um, is capacitors store energy and unless the circuits designed to drain them down or the tubes are in that really helps drain down the capacitors in many cases um, you can get electrocuted right now um, so before we start poking around here why don't we discharge the cap the capacitors 
So this is our discharge tool that we use on the bench. We have a Let's very... just back out a yeah. little bit for everybody. We... we have a very simple clip wire and a poking tool that's conductive. And in here we have a fairly low value resistor. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring the positive of the cap to ground through that resistor. Now hang on, we got actually in a lot of trouble. Somebody said that we weren't using this tool properly. So let's see if we can do it properly so that people don't freak out. So here is a good ground point right here. And I'm nowhere near the interior of the amp where I can get electrocuted. So we bring the probe at a distance onto a positive contact in the filter chain or the 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 B plus rail. Now, and we didn't see anything this time, but you, if these caps were fully charged, you'd see a good little snap and, and spark there. Oh you'd hear it even. So it's actually important um, if you're discharging to come in fairly quickly and firmly. You don't want to sort of uh, come in haphazardly because you could end up with a hell of a big arc and probably a little bit of a, uh, um, a bit of damage where you didn't make good contact. You're essentially creating a, a really quick weld. A little spot weld point. Yeah, so come in quickly. Anyways, we didn't have a spark because there were tubes in here and there's actually a circuit that's designed to drain down the capacitors, but that's not, you can't presume that in any situation. And in fact, um, in all of our builds, while we're prototyping, every time we go into a chassis, whether it's plugged in or whether we, whether we think or don't think that it's been discharged before we start to work in the chassis, we discharge. And we call that making it safe, yeah? So everybody should make safe, it's just uh, a good habit to get into. So now I can go in here and I'm still going to be poking around with a non-conductive poker. So here's the very first cap in the power supply. This is the power supply board. Now this is, this is a prototype, so don't get too fussed with, you know, how things aren't perfectly neat and arranged and it's no. been rebuilt a bunch of times. <laughs> yeah, it's been rebuilt a bunch of times. It's not terrible. We try to build neat prototypes, but when you rebuild and rebuild, things get a little messy. This is a very small first cap for solid state rectification because it can handle a lot more inrush. So this is 47 microfarad. Um, you would probably, for most tube rectifiers, you're going to have something, you'll have to look at your data sheet, but you're going to have something really small. 10 to maybe 47 microfarad, maybe even lower. But here are the filter caps. And what they're doing is they're cleaning up the noise floor of the uh, rectified DC supply. And at the end of the day, we have very, very clean um, DC, or what's called the B plus feed to the plates of the 6082. Now, um, you can see in here that we could have put whatever value we wanted into here. They're all the same standard size. But what's happening, of course, as I mentioned earlier, is that the more capacitance you can put into your filter stages, generally speaking, the quieter your filter is going to get. The better they perform. The better they perform. So, yeah, it's it's a it's actually a real it's a real problem. We almost should do a write up in the store warning people, but you know, uh, really what we need to do is to get the Chinese manufacturers to start recognizing that if they're actually specking a 5U4 tube or a 6N1P, that they've got to have to. Uh, do trials with the actual vintage tubes themselves, which is something we do all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that we have on our list to do with this is we did all of our development work with one particular tube, um, a really excellent 6080 that we happen to have found quite a few Toshibas for. These are just rock solid. <laughs> In fact, we've made a few mistakes in the prototype 
build and and put a lot more current through these tubes than they were ever designed for and they took it like a champ <laughs> yeah i think when you saw the current surging uh, i thought i heard a squeal from you and then I said, turn it off. <laughs> yeah. I think at one point we were passing uh, 400 milliamps a tube, maybe more than that. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it, was a little, it was a lot of current. Um, so uh, in this particular prototype, we're going to test the first generation 6080s. They're called the 6AS7Gs. We're going to test the Soviet version of that tube. And we're going to test uh, the very high uh, spec output version of the 6080. What's yeah, the number uh, on the 6080WC? WC, and we'll probably test a couple of other manufacturers. And the whole point of that is yeah, to make sure they all work right that's and right. as expected. Yeah, that's right. So that's all manufacturers of new modern gear need to do. And then they'll quickly realize. Oh, okay, we have a problem here. Or, okay, those tubes all work fine. We're good. And now let's just put some hours on them and make sure we really are good. Okay, now uh, let's do, um, let's reset the bench and we're going to do a little bit of inrush testing so you can see exactly what we're talking about. Okay, so what we've done is, you can't see it, but, well, let me pull it out here for you. <laughs> So we've taken a standard um, IEC cord, uh, a good heavy gauge one, and I've taken and split out the hot feed wire, the AC hot wire, and I've split it so that I can run it in and out, see the two wires, in and out of a volt ohm meter with the ammeter function um, engaged, and we've got it set for um, for the amp range and well it's set for AC current and it's set for uh, to register peak it's a little peak peak and hold um, well it'll show the peak in the smaller text right here yeah okay so we're gonna do three startups the first one we're gonna start um, the OTL headphone amp with no tubes in it so go ahead Charles and fire it up and let's see if there's any current Okay, so we just saw a maximum of 1.162 amps. Okay, excellent. Okay, so let's turn it off. Let's discharge the capacitors to make safe. And we'll be back in a second with the tubes loaded. Okay, actually before we put the tubes in, I'm just going to turn off the power here and we're going to discharge put, this put on camera. Put up there where it's safe. Alright, now watch the little zap. You see that? That is a big discharge. Let's do the other side. Ah, not as much there. Okay, so they had already drained down a little bit by that point. Okay, let's get some tubes in. Okay, so what we've done is we've loaded the 6080 tubes. There's two of them in this amp. We've turned on the filament so that um, they are pre-warmed and uh, they're lamped. I just took a look at them. And now Charles is gonna turn on the high voltage. That's the household mains, and we'll see how much current we get with that configuration. Okay, here we go. Okay, so we were 1.162 with no tubes in. How much current did we get with the tubes loaded and pre-warmed? Now we're at 1.269. So a little bit higher current because we actually have a path to ground now through the tubes. Okay, so let's reset and we're going to do one more test. Okay, so the tubes are in, the filaments are not lamped, and there's no B plus power. So what we're going to do is we're going to find out, now this only really experiment only applies if you've got um, one of our kit amps or there's quite a few um, really well designed amps out there in which they, they'll have two on switches. One will lamp the filament and one will lamp the high voltage, the B+. And that gives you some options on how to start up your amp. So what we're going to do is do it in reverse. So we're going to turn on the household mains, which gives us the high voltage B+. So Charles, go ahead and lamp, uh, go ahead and turn that on. Okay, so we got a, only uh, 435 milliamps of 
of surge there, so much lower than the other two tests, and less than half. So let's go ahead now and we'll put, hang on a second, let me clear this. So 0.435, I'm going to reset it. And we're going to turn on the filament now, and we'll watch as that, that current slowly comes up. Might take a minute, maybe I'll speed this up in editing. <laughs> Yeah, now the filaments are warming, and the bigger the tube, the longer it takes for a filament to heat up. So a really small miniature 9-pin normally warms up in about, what, 20 seconds? Yeah, something the, like that, yeah. But a, a big tube like the 6AS7 or a KT88, they can take a couple of minutes to come up to full uh, temperature. Well, this actually isn't too bad. So there we go, so we're climbing up, and we're mostly stable already. Yeah, something like uh, 6AS7, 6080, or KT88 will be at its uh, full operating temperature um, within uh, 30 seconds, maybe, but it takes a little while for the entire tube sort of to come up to its full operating temperature and to work optimally. But we're only talking about a couple of minutes. Some people advocating warming your amp up 20 minutes before listening session or hours in some cases and all you're doing is is uh putting hours on your filaments that you will just shorten the life of your tube so don't do that <laughs> okay what is our our current now it is uh so our maximum was 0.328 amps so that's 328 milliamps so what have we learned uh, we were up around, what, 500 uh, in the previous? Uh, no, in the previous, actually. Well, um, we were around 4-something in the previous one on sort of the soft startup. But before doing that, we were up well over an amp on the inrush current. Yeah, 1.269. And if this had a weaker fuse in the, in the IEC inlet here, we would have probably blown that. Okay, so what have we learned? Well, we've learned that if you actually have... Um, uh, a tube amp with two switches, one for the filament, one for the house mains or high voltage, that it's a lot smarter, I think, to turn on the high voltage first, the house mains, uh, and just wait a couple of seconds and then turn on the filament because essentially what happens is you get a fill of the capacitors um, without the tubes conducting. And but that, as the tubes warm up, you get a soft start and you don't have as large of an inrush in current stressing your circuit. And why do we get a soft start? Uh, because the tubes slowly start conducting current and yeah, as and they the, heat up. And the filaments take a while to, to warm up. So that is a, it's essentially a built-in soft start. Now, there's a lot of ways of soft starting equipment, including thermistors and... Uh, damper diodes. Um, there's, you know, all sorts of different ways. There, there's probably... A, a couple of dozen ways of doing it effectively. But you've got to remember there's always a price to pay to put something in between your wall plug, which is over here, um, and your your output tubes. Remember, think of any, any amplifier, whether it's solid state or tube, as being essentially a complicated valve regulating the house mains. <laughs> That's really what it comes down to in its simplest form. So anytime you put something in between um, your output tubes and your house mains, it's going to affect the sound. Maybe not a lot, but in my opinion, you should put as little as, as is required, the minimum, in between um, your house mains and your power supply and filter stages. So, and this just happens to be the, I know it looks like a lot of filter stages, but there's no choke on the input of this, um, of this filter stage. So it takes a fair amount of capacitors and capacitance to build a very low noise headphone amp. Because you, with headphones, you hear... You hear everything. You hear everything. Yeah. So, I mean, it's actually amazing how much you can hear in the studio that I don't even think the mastering engineers we're picking up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we've been very, uh, very happy with the detail on, on this amp so far, and hopefully we'll talk about it some more soon for you guys. Yeah, I mean, I've heard some freaky stuff. I've heard <laughs> the cloth of singers, so their clothing moving. Yep. I've heard, you know, little sounds way in the background of the studio that were, they probably never realized were getting picked up. 
So yeah, things like shuffling feet too. Yeah. It's it's pretty oh, funny. <laughs> yeah, low level humming. Yeah, particularly with uh, early jazz recordings, um, people, uh, you know, the the guy playing the upright bass. Um, wants to hum along with the tune and, uh, <laughs> and it gets picked up and yeah. it gets picked up but uh you know back in the day when they were mastering it they may not have even realized that it was on the recording yeah. um so anyways hopefully that's helpful um and hopefully a little bit of inrush current was a bit of fun and informative so charles what came in well, let's clear the deck and take a look yeah Okay, Charles, what came in? Okay, well, we've been able to get in some more of our favorite Loctals to rebase, including the late version 7F7, which of course is the equivalent of the late version Sylvania 6SL7. Uh, some of the best uh, early high gain tubes available. Yeah, and in fact, uh, Sylvania made, uh, what, maybe 98% of all the Loctal tubes? Practically all of them. There's a few outliers, but they're almost not worth mentioning. Now, we remanufacture these, so we put a high-quality um, uh, base onto it with uh, gold-plated gold, <laughs> gold gold brass pins. <laughs> and um, the weird thing about... Uh, when we first started rebasing these tubes is that they actually sounded better than the octal version we were copying. The, yep. in, the internals are exactly the same. So how that happened, I don't know. Um, but uh, it's just it's just amazing. And Sylvania um, made a whole a line of, of 6SL7s, and we'll look at in a minute the 6SN7. And this one probably came from the 1960s, which would be the end of the production for the Loctal type. But they made tubes, uh, different earlier generations of this tube that are a little different that go back to the 1950s, the 1940s, and believe it or not, the late 1930s. And we have all those tubes. And, and generally, the older you go, the better the tubes sound. They have yeah. more of that Sylvania house sound, more of that warmth. And that applies to pretty much every vintage tube out there. It's not a firm and fast rule. It's just a very general rule. Okay, what's next, Charles? Well, you... we have one of those very early tubes. So this is a uh, Loctal 7N7 that we've rebased into a 6SN7. And this is the equivalent of one of the very first mil spec 6 and 6 SN7s ever made by Sylvania, the uh, 6 SN7W. So this is the lock to the equivalent rebase. Yep. So it would have had the same internals and they're very interesting tubes. They're essentially, it's a GT tube, although it might be specced a bit higher because they were military tubes. They but we still don't recommend these for modern amps. Unless it's, they were designed to run a GT tube. Yeah, it's just they're, they're too valuable they're they're essentially um treasured antique tubes yeah. um that we've been lucky enough to find enough to make up match pairs occasionally we get singles and pairs in and uh, we actually have one pair of these in the store right now we might be able to get some more soon because we have more that have had their bases pulled that means i've got some more tubes to make yeah and what else do we have here well we have we've been able to find some more hitachi six cg sevens this is the uh, six fq7 which is the exact same tube just with a different number you see that quite a bit with vintage tubes you'll have more than one number sometimes you'll have up to a dozen or two numbers for a tube type now why is the six cg7 so interesting oh well, it's a six sn7 it's essentially one of these guys in a nine pin bottle and if you use a nine pin octal adapter it will work in any six sn7 circuit out there and here's one of those adapters right here Ooh. so these are great tubes. Um, we haven't had a lot of the Hitachis in, but we just got in a nice batch of them uh, to go along with the Toshibas that people are really a fan of. Um, and uh, they're, they're great tubes. And they're one of those ones that tends to test a lot higher. So both the 6GU7 and 6CG7 versions of these Hitachi tubes, these, these dual triode nine pins, all test higher than the, the spec calls for. So they generally have a uh, better amplification factor and better testing numbers. We actually have to turn down our testers to test these guys. Yeah, we were actually just talking about building tubes off spec and... It's not just a modern thing. It's not just a modern thing. Um, 
So, uh, and it's not just a Chinese thing. Uh, the Japanese uh, would goof things up. Uh, Soviets, pretty uh, much everybody who ever made tubes would occasionally build something off spec, particularly near the end of the second tube era, just as the plants were starting to shut down in the late 70s, early 1980s. Uh, I think a lot of staff had gone and a lot of professionals um, had been laid off. So and, and maybe some of the tubes they were manufacturing, they never even expected to get used because it was just sort of excess stock in a, in a time when tubes were getting phased out. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of weird, a lot of weird tubes happened in the, the span of maybe five years that came off of those manufacturing lines just before they shut down. Mm -hmm. Okay. You got one more. Yeah. And this one is a, a nice treat because we actually haven't opened it yet. And here we have a beautiful vintage NEC and that stands for the Nippon Electric Company. And NEC, amazingly... Yeah, right down there, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, NEC, amazingly, was actually set up, their tube production was set up by Western Electric, which oh. is going to ring alarm bells for anybody out there that loves Western Electric tubes. And this is a 6080. So just like the Toshiba that we looked at earlier for the OTL amp, we've been trying to find these guys. NEC made some really nice tubes. Yeah, and NEC is still around. Uh, we have a list of manufacturers for electrolytic capacitors that we consider to be high quality. It's really important in the kit amps to put good quality capacitors. It's, it's the difference between a well-designed um, uh, amplifier and selection of components. Got a lot of wrapping on this guy. <laughs> so, uh, Nippon makes great capacitors as well. So I'll take those any day. Wow. Take a look at that. So this is a new old stock tube. It probably hasn't been out of its package since it was manufactured. Yeah, that's a beast. And We're going to have to try some of these in the OTL amp and see. I don't know if we told everybody what an OTL headphone amp is. Uh, output transformerless. So you're actually direct coupling the headphones to the tube. Via uh, via capacitor. Or, yeah. or you could get electrocuted. It's not the most efficient way of, of transferring power, but it produces a really interesting sound. And well, this, this is a neat tube. This actually looks a lot like the Sylvania 6AS7s or 6080. I would go beyond neat. I would say the Sonics are just stunning. Yeah. I mean, the level of detail is beyond anything I've ever heard. Yeah, and we were not expecting that out of an OTL amp. So this is well, I this is an interesting was. tube. Um, so I don't know. Maybe at some point we'll figure out how to do a recording off of it and uh, and try to share that on the channel. Okay. Well, thanks for doing that, Charles. If you've stayed to the very end, sorry the video got a little longer than we were hoping. But hopefully it was a little bit of fun. Um, we've got a whole bunch of discount codes that people like to grab, including an easy to figure out secret code. We can reach most people with flat rate, $20 shipping. If you're in a difficult to ship area, please use a mail forwarder or contact us before ordering. That includes the Philippines, island nations, and you know, you would, if you're in a difficult to ship region, you, you probably know it. You probably know it. So don't just order. Um, contact us first. And for the rest of you, if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.